Hello, and welcome to the second joint Foreman and Catello demo. Uh, we got a few items from both projects we're going to show today. Uh, we will be starting uh, with Walden, who's going to uh, show some updates and changes to uh, Barada. Over to you, Walden. All right. Should be pretty quick. Um, so this is the Arata list page here. Um, during this past sprint, uh, we addressed some confusion between uh, the terms applicable and installable for Arata used to be applicable and available. Um, we renamed available to installable uh, to kind of lessen the phonetic confusion between the two. Um, and we also added um, on this page, um, we used to show all errata even if it wasn't applicable to um, any content host. Um, so here we're now we're defaulting to applicable. And you can also filter by installable. And you'll notice that first um, that first errata that wasn't installable is now gone. And if you wanted, you can um, you can show uh, all the errata by unchecking both boxes, um, and you'll notice that the count here is much greater now, and we're showing stuff that's not even applicable or installable. Uh, so I'm over my time. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I will fill them now. If you could just stick around while in that way, since there's that 30-second delay, and we'll pick up questions sort of after the next one. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Walden. Uh, up next, uh, we have Justin, um, who's going to show a variety of things, from separating puppet environments to GPT keys to a capsule, and some of the... Uh, composite and component updates that are coming along with incremental updates. All right, Justin. All right, can you see my screen all right? Assume so. Um, all right, so as part of this, um, we had had some feedback that a user um, and customers both sent us feedback that we want um, the ability to use separate lifecycle environments and content views for our provisioning as from our puppet environment. Um, so this basically added the ability to separate those. Um, so in this scenario, you see the, the, this is a host group. It currently has a separate um, lifecycle environment content view as its puppet environment. Um, if I change it, it, it won't actually update. Um, but if I want to reset it and sync them up, I can just click this little link and um, they will reset. And then, for example, if I submit that, oops. Apologies. Um, and then, so now they match. If I, if I go in and change it, um, the, the puppet environment automatically updates as well. And this carries on to hosts. If I go into a host, um, I can pick a lifecycle environment. Um, a content view, and it will fill in the puppet environment. If I select a host group, the inheritance um, will carry through, um, and actually I had selected the same one, I think, as the host group, um, but the inheritance will carry through, and it will select here. Um, this works together with, um, on the host group screen, the activation keys tab, uh, so it now uses those instead of the puppet environment. Uh, it works on the provisioning templates um, to, or actually, sorry, on the, on the host object, to properly calculate the uh, Kickstart URL if you're using a content view for kickstarting. Um, and generally just allows the user a bit more control 
over where their content and their public content is coming from. Um, and then next item, um, let's see. Uh, I'll skip this one for now, uh, but keeping track of components. Um, so previously, it, when once you created a component, let me go back to this tab so it doesn't log me out. Once you created a component, uh, we lost all track of uh, where the published, or sorry, or once you published a composite version, we lost all track of where that um, composite version came from, what it was made of. So here we added some tracking. If we go into our composite here, and we'll go into version 2.0, we can see that this this uh, 2.0 is made up of um, version 1.0 of these other two content views. Um, so this then allows us to do composite updating as part of incremental updates. Uh, so you see here. This is a uh, Postman API call, very similar to the last sprints that performed an incremental update, um, specifying the errata ID I want, which content view version, which environment I want it to go to. Uh, this just added a new option, propagate to composites, um, and I ran this exact call, and um, which was updating version uh, with an ID of 35, which is version 1.0 of this component. You can see here 35. Um, and it also updated, when I created this 1.1 version, it updated the composite to 2.1 automatically. Um, I'm not going to run it here just because it takes uh, so much time. And then the last thing I was going to show was um, adding GPG key support to um, the capsules, or sorry, uh, being able to proxy the caps, the GPG fetching through the capsules so that if you had a repository that was protected by GPG key, it would, um, it would fetch it through the capsule. And this relies on the reverse proxy um, to be in place. So let's see, I've got a terminal I need to share. Okay. So this is a client um, that is uh, subscribed to the satellite or the Catello server and is subscribed to some YUM content that is set up using a GPG key. If we look in rhsm.conf, um, we'll see that the base URL is not set to the main server, it is set to a capsule. Um, and so then if we look at the Etsy Red Hat repo file, which is uh, what points us to the GPG key and to the um, content, you see here it's using the proxy, and the GPG key is now using the proxy as well. So instead of going to the main Catello server, it's going uh, through the proxy to fetch the GPG key. And I think I made it through with a minute to spare. Um, so if there are, I'll hang out, but if there are no questions, um, I'll hand it back over to Eric. Uh, all right. Uh, there's a question for Walden, and then right. a question for you, Justin. So if you'll just hang on. I think I'm next. Uh, yeah, just a second, guys. Yeah, it looks like something's GPG key mentioned kind of warmed my heart. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Uh, mute yourself, please. Anyway, can you guys? Um, it looks like uh, Mike already answered uh, Brian's question for me. Um, yeah, basically, applicable just means that the host needs the errata, and installable is that it needs the errata and it can actually install it because it's available in the lifecycle environment. All right, and then Justin, uh, for you, uh, if it was a new host group, will the puppet env default to the one from the content view lifecycle environment? Are you there, Justin?
I guess he decided to mute himself. Alright, I, I will move on uh, to the next presenter. Uh, up next will be Partha showing off content view version uh, details. Over to you, Partha. I don't think anyone heard it. Partha, are you there? All right. Uh, one more time. Are you there, Partha? Okay. We'll try and circle back. Um, next, then, moving on, uh, we're going to Alex, who is going to talk about uh, testing multi-capsule sync. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, we can. It's all yours, Alex. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I have, uh, first off, I'm Alex Cross. I work with the performance engineering team. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be just kind of quickly going over some of the multi-capsule syncing tests that I've done. Um, so there's many variables to test here, the number of capsules, the size of RPMs, uh, the number of RPMs that I'm syncing, the number of repos that I'm pushing to those, and then... Uh, what operating system I'm running it on top of, as well as tunables within those operating systems and, and some of the, uh, the different uh, things that you can configure within the, the application itself. Uh, so here's my test bed. Um, you've got Satellite 6 servers, that's running Catello, Foreman, Pulp, Candlepin, all there. And I'm pushing the content from that Satellite 6 server out to the capsules themselves. The capsules are virtual machines because limited on hardware. Assets, so I have three uh, machines that are that are have seven, seven, and six number of capsules pinned to each of those machines. Each of the capsules just have two virtual CPUs. Then I also have a monitoring and workload uh, server there that's pushing, that's using the hammer command to push um, that content to those capsules. Uh, so here's some results. Before I go through these results, let's kick off um, a quick demo here. So this is on the, uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, if it's big enough or not, but this is uh, my test case script. I'll, I'll start that off. It's going to run against 20 capsules. I'm going to sync uh, 2,048, 256 uh, kilobyte RPMs to each of them. I'll also start off just a monitoring script on, this is the Satellite 6 machine, and this is the one of the capsules. There's there's 20 of them, so it's hey, pretty difficult Alex, to watch 20. Trying to show it's a terminal. Uh, all we can see is the presentation right now. Ooh. Um, you may just need to swap what you're sharing. Yeah, let's try to do that. Stop and then try again. Entire screen. All right, can you see it now? <clears throat> so... Basically, I run a monitoring uh, application that's internal to our team um, for performance uh, metric um, gathering. So it'll gather those metrics while it performs the, sy the syncs themselves. So we're watching right now. This is on the Satellite 6 machine. If we watch the CPU, we saw the user CPU just shot up there quickly. Those are the hammer commands incoming. And now I'm watching the Ethernet I.O. We can start to see the I.O. there kick up. That's um, all the capsules are hitting the Satellite 6 machine now, requesting the, that content. So you can see the accumulated I.O. is growing at, we're at about a gig right there, and 2 gigs, 3 gigs, 4 gigs, 5 gigs. So it's quickly pushing this content out to those, those capsules. I'm sorry, the capsules are quickly grabbing the content off of the Satellite 6 machine there. You can even switch over to the capsule itself and see the Ethernet I.O. down this column in megabytes, and you see that it, it actually synced all 512 megabytes 
fairly quickly there. So once we'll go back here, and we're, we're still waiting for that sink to finish on those 20 capsules. The Satellite 6 machine is still getting hit for some Ethernet I.O. Oh, it just dropped now down to zero, so all the capsules have got their content now. So now we're just kind of waiting for Pulp to do that last little bit of uh, post-processing of the files. Um, we can even look at the individual capsule and see that that I.O. accumulated has, has pretty much stopped at this point. <clears throat> and it's actually completed all the sinks. So on the Satellite 6 machine itself, I maintain I, uh, I output all of the timing values out to uh, these files right here. So for all 20 capsules, I have all 20 timing values. I'll go like that right there, and I already pre-baked pre a command to just grep for the real times out of them and then split that into uh, seconds and then run that through this little Python histogram um, script right there so I can look at the histogram results so we can see the mean for all capsules to sync that content took 54 seconds. Um, the max was 75 seconds. The minimum was 43 seconds. So that's pretty cool. We were able to get that content pretty quickly. Um, while that's pushing, that already pushed <clears throat> my metrics. I'm running out of time here. This is where I keep all the metrics. So I can look at the satellite server's CPU Right here, so we can we can see the CPU usage on the satellite machine itself. Uh, not that much for um, pushing to 20 capsules there. And uh, let me close this out with just going back to my graph here. All right, and you can basically see with this graph, I've graphed two through 20 capsules. In that, uh, this test is showing actually rail 6, so it's a, the performance is just a little bit less than what we saw with rail 7 there. We saw the upper end at 75 seconds. The upper end on this, this particular run was 91 seconds. You can see the max there at 20 capsules. So what's good about this results is that the line is fairly flat. So increasing the number of capsules didn't really, uh, did not impact as, as badly as I thought um, just syncing that content. And that's mainly because it, you know, the capsules themselves are hitting Apache and grabbing that content off of there. So <clears throat> that's pretty much all I have. If there's any questions, I'm not sure if you want me to take them now or wait for them to, uh, to come through. Uh, if you could just stick around and, uh, in case they pop up, um, we'll ask uh, the field them after the next presenter. Okay. Uh, and thank you. Uh, so over to Lukash to uh, talk about uh, Catello SE Linux split out. Can you guys hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, great. Uh, so share my screen. Uh, Google Hangouts. Share. Uh, so you should hopefully see my screen. This will be short. Um, I've extracted our Foreman S Linux uh, rules uh, rules for Catal plugin into a separate separate uh, Git repo. It's called Catal S Linux, and the important th uh, thing I want to tell you is that uh, it's a it's a it's a new repo under the same uh, URL. So you need to you know delete your wipe off the the, ex the old one if you have the, have the check out check out and check out a new a clone a new uh, Actually, uh, all I want to say is that we have a we have a Catello, uh, rules and Catello related rules. For example, uh, Elasticsearch uh, things, and I will be poking around when I need to uh, review or, or test uh, some things because I'm I'm maintaining the thing and try hard to test things, but usually I struggled, and this, this was the problem when this was in the Formless Linux because Dominic was the only one who who volunteered to test 
and, and review the stuff. So I'll be likely, you know, when, when there will be some patch in regard to the, well, let's say Docker, I will fork uh, Docker guys to test my changes there. So uh, the the thing is to improve our, you know, workflow and to uh, push, you know, changes into Catalyst Linux uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and there's Makefile that uh, that really helps you with everything and. And there's one I interesting uh, make target, which is load, uh, I think, remote load, which can you, uh, which will actually deploy this policy onto uh, remote host, so you can easily, you know, have a beaker instance or your testing uh, lab or whatever, and uh, deploy the, the the policy for testing very easily. It's just one liner for me. It's big big help. So please, if I you know ping you, just you know help me with this thing. Thank you. How do I unsure? All right. Uh, thanks, Lukash. Uh, like the others, if I stick around just in case any questions come through for you. Uh, up next, uh, we have uh, Shlomi, who's going to talk about user time zones. Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm going to show my screen. Um, okay, so up until now, um, we have uh, displayed all of our times in UTC time zone, uh, the universal time zone, and we thought it would be uh, very cool to have um, user uh, time zone. So basically what, I, what we've added is on your user account, you have a new a tab, which is time zone. The default is the browser time zone, but you can change it. For instance, I'm working from, I would say, Bratislava, or that's something more interesting. Um, Tbilisi, for instance. And once I'm saved, the time zone will be changed um, to my selected uh, time zone. Emails will be sent on your time zone, and all other reports will be displayed that time zone. So this is about um, user time zones. Um, I'll now switch to talk about uh, OpenSCAP, if that's OK. Um, OpenSCAP um, is a line of standards which checks um, the security of configurations and is examining system for uh, signs of compromise. To start with that, and this is a very big issue, and we'll have a deep dive uh, on it. Uh, to start with that, we need to upload a new SCAP content. We give it some kind of a title, for instance, rel, and choose uh, the file that you wish to have. Let me, for instance, say that this is my time zone. It's a specific set of rules which uh, then goes and tests um, on your client machine. <clears throat> Once the, it is uploaded, I can create a new policy from that SCAP content. So I go to policies and create a new compliance policy. I give it a name. Let's call it, for instance, uh, rel policy. Um, I can then choose to, to which SCAP content I wish to have it working, so I can choose the rel one and select the, the profile that I wish to test with. Uh, note here that I need to ensure that the same SCAP content, content is uploaded to the host that I wish to examine. I can then schedule, for instance, um, weekly or monthly and, and select a day. As all of our uh, systems, I can assign it to a location and organization. And at the end, I can apply it um, to a specific host group that I wish to have. Once I'm applying that, it will um, uh, it will apply the policy and create a uh, update the public class which the policy uses to run on all their servers. So this is now I have a few policies that I can work with. I'll switch for a second to the server um, to install. Um, the ASCAP client, all you have to do is gem install 
from an SF client. Once it, it's installed, you can configure it. With our Puppet client, it will be auto-configured by itself. The configuration looks like that. It says which is our um, proxy server and which policies we have, the, their form and IDs, and which profile and content path we are having. To run it, it's very simple. You just run from an SCAP client, and you give the ID that you wish to check. It's running it. It takes a minute. It, it tests all the security compliances that you had in your SCAP content. And it is uh, it, the content is uploaded then to the smart proxy. And from the smart proxy, you can just run um, a smart proxy open SCAP send. This is another gem which is installed on the smart proxy. Show me if you're showing your terminal, we aren't able to see it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was sure. No Do you see it now? I uh, still just see your web browser being shared. Okay, and now? Share the terminal itself. Okay. I'm sorry. Anyhow, it is sending the data from the smart proxy and performance, and then the data is aggregated on the reports. On the reports, you can see, according to your host name, um, how many tests have passed, how many have failed, and if there are any other issues that you may want to take in attention, so it also displays it. You can view the full report. Okay, so you can scroll down and see which um, which report, which tests have passed and which tests have failed. And basically, that's it. This is for the current version. On the next version, uh, we're going to have a dashboard for each view, which may look like this, which will tell you how many of the latest reports have passed, how many have failed. And you could see the trend over time. So first, I had 11 failed. Um, uh, checks and I've applied some tests, uh, some fixes, and now they're coming down. Uh, one last thing about the reports, which is important to know, is that when you're clicking on a report, um, it can give you the remediation uh, for each of the failing uh, tests. So you can click on a clicking disabled, for instance. The status is failed, and it's telling you how you what are the steps you should do to fix it? That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It looks like we have a question about time zones for you real quick. Um, uh, the question is, will time zones be reflected in plugins such as the Catello Angular-based uh, UI or other pl plugins? And what about showing that time zone in Hammer API calls? It's a very good question regarding Hammer. I'm not sure, but basically, um, it will it will reflect on all of your uh, plugins. It is supposed to reflect on all of your plugins. Uh, if there is an issue on a plugin, there are lots of times uh, which we use the get local uh, method, which that should be removed, and then it will use the user's time zone. All right. Thank you. Uh, up next, uh, we have Greg, who's going to give us a networking recap. Uh, thanks, Eric. Sound okay? Good. So I'm clear. Good, good. Sorry, I've obviously just come back from something else, so I hadn't had time to do the tests. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know we did a deep dive a little while ago about uh, the upcoming networking features uh, in Formula 1.8. Uh, these were merged to develop this week, uh, two days ago. Uh, so you'll already be seeing them in nightly. Um, we're already finding lots of interesting issues. Um, we knew this was going to happen. This is a bit like when we merged the authorization changes back in 1.5. We knew we were going to find a lot of interesting issues. Um, so please do test. Um, if you want to remind yourself of the, the features um, and, and the rationale behind them, then please do, do go and view the deep dive. 
Um, but just as a very brief reminder, basically um, all interfaces on hosts are now first-class citizens. There is no more implicit interface on the host object itself. So host.ip, host Mac, host subnet, host domain, these are all delegated to the interfaces model now. Um, so this can lead to some interesting situations, particularly if you're doing things like scope search by subnet, um, might need some updates, um, just things to be aware of. Um, we're also interested in um, use cases, feedback. Um, there's still a lot more networking uh, work to do. Uh, there's a tracker. I believe it's 2409 um, if, uh, if you want to go and uh, have a look at what we've already got planned. Um, and we're interested in uh, what, anybody, what everybody else comes across while they're using it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's all. Oh, oh, hang on. Uh, Marek says he can show the UI, which I don't have set up at the moment, so maybe we should let him do that. Sounds good. Okay, so I'll try to share my screen. Um, yeah. So I hope you can see uh, my browser. So as Greg said, uh, we have basically extracted the primary interface. So uh, when you want to build a new host, uh, you you can see the changes. Uh, there are still some small issues, but um, it should basically work. So now, when I filled in some basic information about the host, I can go to Interfaces tab, and you can see that we no longer have a big form for all interfaces, but it's uh, per interface, and we display the interface in a model window. And you can see here that the DNS name for that primary interface is, was taken from the host name. And it's synchronized, so if I change it here, go back to host, I see the change also here. And to reflect that, I also see the host name in the header. So when I create a second interface, I give it some other name. Um, and now I can make it primary. You can see that the host name changes as well. So uh, I can select primary and provision flag. And this also means that I can now have two separate subnets, one for provisioning, one for uh, one, one being primary, which uh, basically gives the host a fully qualified domain name that is used, for example, in a puppet certificate. Um, yeah, so uh, one more thing, important change. When I add a new interface, we also took the fields from the uh, from the compute resource tab. So here I can map it to the uh, virtual interface that's being created in a libvirt. Uh, I can select the, the subnet that it will be attached to. Uh, here's also the not, not notification that uh, we moved this from the virtual machine tab. So um, you can set it in the networking tab. So that's quickly it. Uh, also one more detail. And we are in a host uh, show page. We added uh, Nick's uh, tab here, so you can see all interfaces of that host. And you also see the primary and provisioning flags. So that's about it, unless there are any questions. Uh, if you don't mind hanging on, the questions may come in. Um, the last thing uh, is we are going to uh, circle back to Partha to show uh, some of the Docker content view details work that uh, we tried to show earlier, but uh, we had a bit of a miscommunication between ourselves. Uh, so if you're there, Partha, over to you. All right. Okay, that doesn't work. Is that better? You use a couple of parties we hear. You want mute? You're muted. Oh, no, I'm muted. Yeah, I did. You're on mute. Yeah. Sounds good now. All right. Woo. Well, we did it. Good team effort here. Anyway, uh, so here's my. Let me start the screen share. All right. There's nothing special here, but. So last time you guys saw me do like a contribute publish, 
this time I add this time we add like a page that shows a little more details on the versions so you can and my friendly page will load uh, you should be able to see uh, so, so here are all the published versions of this content view click on versions all right. And you click on Docker repositories. And, and voila, there it is. There you see all the all the repos that are, that are relevant to this version. Here's because I've published it to two environments, you see two repositories there. Um, this is very similar to what we have for YUM repositories and there are on top of modules. It's the same kind of thing. Uh, hopefully, the next sprint will show you the Catello integration part. Uh, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Uh, we will see if they come in, uh, but uh, thank you. And uh, a question uh, for the networking guys. Um, do you have specific hardware resources you are using to test BMC? Well, that's probably a question for Greg, because I'm more working on the uh, virtual uh, networking. So we haven't done much testing of the BMC. That's something that would be very appreciated, because we have a, a lack of hardware, really. It is difficult to test without dedicated hardware. Um, I believe it should be fine. Um, it's a type of interface. So you would add, just like you used to do, where you added the extra interface on the networking tab, you can still do that. One of the fields uh, in that modal is the type of interface, so you can still select BMC and still provide all of the username and password and so on. So it should be fine, but if you've got access to BMC hardware, please do uh, test it and let us know, and we'll, we'll try and fix any issues with it. All right, uh, that looks like the end of the questions and the end of the demo. I want to thank all of the uh, presenters and those who watched and uh, asked our presenters questions. Uh, that's it. Thanks for coming. See ya. Bye, guys.